Church, would you lift your hands high in praise as we praise him tonight? Father God, we've sung hallelujah tonight. We want to express our praise to you tonight. Wonderful Lord and God. Uh, what, a, what a privilege to stand in your presence, not just as an individual, but as your gathered people. We raise our hands. We, we say hallelujah to you. All praise and honor and glory to you, our wonderful Lord and God. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen, amen. Welcome tonight to church. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Always good to be here. Move around, greet as many people as you can. Find somebody you haven't said hello to for a week or two, all right? Find someone. Probably never said hello to them in your life before. Moving around, greeting people all around the place. Please be seated, church, unless you go to kids' church. You'll be on your way out the door following Mrs. Lara and her team of green-shirted kids' church people tonight. There they go. Give them a big round of applause, everyone. Yeah. Hey, uh, next Sunday is Vision Sunday, and that's both morning and evening. And uh, we're going to be talking a lot next week about kids and kids' ministry and youth and families and marriages and you and me and... A whole lot of things that make for a better future for this church as we reach out to all the people that live around us. And so many live around us, thousands, thousands. We've been inundated with a demographic of young families, uh, mum and dad in their 20s and 30s with kids. Kids from the cradle to late teens. No, not the grave. Well, that's, that, that, that's us. That's us folks that are a bit older than that. And uh, the demographic of tw 29 years of age, average. And interestingly enough, we've just done a, a, an exercise with our church, and the average age of our church is a little below that, it's 28. Yeah? So we're, we're right in there. So come along next week, and I am so looking forward to Vision Sunday. We're going to get into it. God's taking us somewhere in a hurry, all right? So fasten your seatbelts, because we're going for it. Father in heaven, uh, thank you. Thank you for your, what you're doing in this church. Yeah, the, the empty grave says that all those fears are banished. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord God. Take us forward uh, tonight and with Vision Sunday and in the days that lie ahead. Uh, we, we don't want to look back. We, we're just looking forward. So thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, fantastic song, that Overcome song, but here's another one that's uh, taken my attention. I know it's taken yours. And it's called Do It Again. It's called Do It Again. And it addresses the fact of the miraculous. Yeah, we didn't get that sign up there tonight. But right up there, imagine you could see up there miracles right on that third screen. That's what it should be there. It didn't quite make it there, but it says miracles, all right? The, the, the graphic's been done. It just hasn't been painted on the wall up there. Miracles. The catch cry of the song Do It Again comes in these lyrics. I've seen you move, move the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way, and I believe I'll see you do it again. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed. Whether it was the miraculous in Joshua's day of the walls of Jericho coming down or the miracles in Elisha's day or the miracles in Elijah's day or, or the miracles in Moses' day, God moved mountains, God uh, knocked walls down, uh, he opened up the Red Sea so that uh, God's people could cross through and he closed it in again when his people were through and those who were chasing them or trying to get through to get them, he closed it in on top of them. He opened up a way through the flooded Jordan River. He provided food in the wilderness and water in the wilderness. Uh, he's done it before and I believe he'll do it again. It's the same God. He's done it before. He will do it again. He is faithful. And so in the coming weeks, 
We'll be looking at some of the Bible faith heroes and the miracles that occurred in, uh, uh, occurred in their lives and in their ministries. And wherever they went, there seemed to be a miracle following them. It wasn't them doing it. It was God that was doing it because he had touched their lives. God has done it before and he will do it again. That's the thesis and the theme uh, that we're following in these weeks in this series. First hero of faith that we're going to be looking at uh, tonight uh, and, and faith and miracles is Moses. Moses. Hebrews chapter 11 uh, contains stories and accounts of uh, God's, uh, I call them heroes of faith. And uh, th this chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, I call it the Heroes, heroes of Faith Hall of Fame. Uh, there's numerous heroes, faith heroes there. And Moses made it into that book. Moses made it into that chapter. Uh, Moses is recorded in the Hall of Faith fame. So he's worth looking at when it, if God's done miracles in him and through him and around him and he's going to do it again, he's worth looking at. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 23 in, the, in this uh, book of the, the Hall of Heroes of, of Faith uh, says this, Hebrews 11 23, By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born. Can you imagine that, parents? Hiding a baby for three months. I don't know what they did. I had five of them, right? And I've got 16 grandkids and I've had them stay over. And I, I'd never be able to hide any of them, kids or grandkids. Just when you try to calm them down, they're excitable and, or, or they get upset and they kind of make a noise, if you know what I mean. But they hid him, hid this fellow for three months. Three months. Because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. So I, I need to tell you about the king's edict, for, for why they're hiding this child for three months and how they got to do the, the hiding and kept it, you know, away from the king who had an edict. Why would they hide him for three months? And what does it mean he is no ordinary child? Well, generations before the birth of Moses, uh, Joseph was a Hebrew lad who ended up in Egypt because his brothers didn't like him. And they sold him into slavery in, into Egypt. But Here's the thing, uh, people can be against you, but if God's for you, you're going to be on the winning team anyway. And over time, he became the prime minister of Egypt. The little slave boy, the little slave Hebrew boy. He became prime minister of the country of Egypt. And during a time of famine, uh, all of his brothers are needing grain. They came down uh, from Canaan to Egypt uh, to purchase uh, grain from this brother they'd sold into slavery, not knowing it's him. And uh, long story short, because we don't want to get into how all that settled out, but Joseph invited them down. They all moved down, all these brothers, 12 tribes of them. And they multiplied. We would say, not too crassly, that they bred like rabbits. There was lots and lots of them. And uh, during this time, these... These Hebrews, they multiplied rapidly and over time a new king, a new pharaoh came to power in Egypt and the reality of the Hebrew Prime Minister Joseph of a previous generation became a distant and faded memory so that it no longer registered with recognition or favour. Who's this Joseph? Exodus 2, 8 to 10 in your NIV, then a new king. No, then a new king. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, uh, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. They, they bred like rabbits, there's so many of them. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will become too numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us and then leave the country. So they deal shrewdly. How, how, how's the Pharaoh and his people going to deal shrewdly? Well, plan A, plan A. Put slave masters over them and oppress them. Make life difficult for them. Make them work so hard that when they go home that night, they're not even going to turn the TV on. They're not going to even talk to the missus. They're going straight to bed to sleep it off to get ready for tomorrow. But the plan didn't work. <laughs> when you're against God's people, the plan won't work. The plan didn't work and the Hebrews continued to multiply. That's what's going on. So plan B, kill the Hebrew baby boys as soon as they are born. Let the girls live. 
but kill the boys. Hence, when Moses was born, his parents hid him. Exodus 2, 1 to 7. I wonder how this will go. Now, man, this is good. Now, a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant. Didn't matter how hard the dad was working during the day with the slave masters, he still got together with mum when he got home and gave birth to a son. And when she saw he was a fine child, I'll come back to this fine child in a minute, she hid him for three months. We've got a saying in Australia that other countries, English-speaking countries, don't tend to have. When someone gets cranky, they spit the... They must have had a pretty good dummy. He wasn't spitting the dummy. They kept him quiet for three months. But when she could hide him no longer because he spat the dummy, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. And then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. And his sister stood at a distance, at a distance to see what would happen to him. Next uh, slide. And then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, as she did. And her attendants were walking along the river bank, and she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. And she opened it up and saw the baby. He was crying. And she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. And then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? It's a good story, isn't it? Uh, see, her dad was going to kill them all. And she wants to take the boy home now, right? Exodus uh, chapter 2 and uh, verse 2 in your NIV says a fine child, right? A fine child, we just read that. Now, if you read the same thing uh, in, in uh, another translation, uh, like the NLT, here we go, next one, next slide. It says, in the next slide, it says, no ordinary child, now that would be uh, Acts 7 verse 20, no ordinary child. And if you read in Hebrews 11:23, same story, but written in the New Testament, no ordinary child. So no matter who you are, you were born for a purpose. I, I think a lot of people never figure out what the purpose is that they were born for, but you were born for a purpose. And when it came to Moses, uh, not only is it a fact that he was born for a purpose, it seemed that his parents recognized that he was born for a purpose. And, and they, they treated him as such. And I just want to say, parents, you have a remarkable privilege and responsibility when God blessed you with your children. Uh, never take that lightly. For every child that was born to you or to anyone else was born for a purpose. Every child is born for... Not all of them will have a purpose like Moses of becoming uh, national and spiritual leaders, but nevertheless, they are born for a purpose. And, uh, and the Pharaoh's daughter saw the basket just floating around the Nile River and the little Hebrew baby boy in the basket crying and her heart was touched. And she asked Dad if she could bring him home. And I would love to have been there for that conversation. I, I imagine how this father-daughter conversation went. I saw a father-daughter conversation right here just some minutes ago. You all saw that was Pastor Lee talking to his daughter, uh, assuring her that he wasn't rich and she was going to get all this dough at all. He's going to skill her up so that she can earn big bucks herself and look after him, something of that nature, you see. So, so is this good? Aren't you glad you came tonight? Yeah, yeah come on, come on. <laughs> a father-daughter conversation. And I imagine how this went. And so the daughter comes home and says, Dad, Dad, guess what? And he says, there's no guessing with you. You know, she well, I went for a walk down the Nile this morning, went for a little dip in the river. Uh, my, my servants were there. And as I was taking this swim and this walk alongside the Nile River, I saw a basket floating in the river with this little baby boy in it. Is it okay, Daddy, <laughs> if I bring him home and raise him? Then the Pharaoh speaks. Pharaoh's got a deep voice. He goes, not a Hebrew boy, is he? Maybe, 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 Dad. Well, you know, the legislation that I have just passed, all Hebrew baby boys are to be killed. Oh, Dad, look at him. He's in the basket, and he's so cute. He has such deep brown eyes. Look at them. And he's got dimples. He's smiling at me. Dad, Dad, I know you're the Pharaoh, but I think he's smiling at you too. 
<laughs> he's smiling at you. Daddy just smiled at you. Can I please keep him? Oh, all right then. <laughs> all right then. What harm can one little baby boy cause? Just lead your whole workforce out of the nation and mess with your entire economy. That's all. <laughs> and I think, you know, I saw my wife, she was sitting here earlier on, and her and her two big helpers that are much taller than her in green shirts went out of here and they're going over there to little kids. What, what harm can those little kids cause? Well, it's not a matter of what harm. What, 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 can they, what can they inject into the whole world? What can they influence in Jesus' name? One little baby boy with brown eyes and dimples in a basket could take the entire workforce out of Egypt and take them through the Red Sea to the Promised Land. I think of those little kids over there tonight, and I think, how do we know? One of them could be a mighty man of God or a mighty woman of God, and you're the parents of them. You're the parents of them. Just lead the whole crowd out. Those of you who work in nursery and kids' church, you are molding and shaping the destiny of those who could become world changers. I hope you're hearing this. Don't ever underestimate the value, uh, parents and uh, children and nursery workers, of what you do and the value of the children with whom you work. Moses was born for a purpose. Miracle number one. <laughs> We're on about miracles. He was saved from the river and saved from a legislated death and plucked from the river and glory to God, his own mother was hired to nurse him. We're just loaded with miracles before we even get going. Born for a purpose and then raised for a purpose. Moses was raised for a purpose. Exodus 2, 8 to 10. I reckon this scripture could be right up there. Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. <laughs> Mum's getting paid to look after your own kids. Yeah? By the government, by the way. By the government. Take this baby and don't pay, I'll pay you. And so the, woman, <laughs> so the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and she became Pharaoh's daughter's son. And she named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Isn't that so cool? Moses, born for a purpose, raised for a purpose. Exodus, Acts chapter 7, verse 22, just a gentle little thing. Moses, think about this. He was going to kill him. He was going to kill every Hebrew baby boy. He didn't kill this one, he took him home. And in, 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 in the Pharaoh's household, in the Pharaoh's university, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was, look at this, and was powerful in speech and in action. This was Moses. He was educated by the Pharaoh. He was trained by the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh put the money in him to make him a great leader that he was. And of course, many of you uh, will be quite familiar with this story uh, about the Moses story. Uh, later on, Moses uh, met God at a burning bush. You know that one? And God spoke to him about uh, leading the people out, the Hebrew people, and speaking to the Pharaoh, saying, let my people go, let my people go. And you know that Moses said he couldn't speak at all. He wouldn't be able to speak to the Pharaoh because as a public speaker, he was a bit of a dud. He just couldn't do it. Exodus 4.10, in case you think I made that up, here it is. Exodus 4.10, Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. That was what Moses said. And I've heard preachers preach on this like they don't want to take Moses' word for it. I don't want to take Moses' word, I want to take God's word, you see. So I read God's word, see what God would say. And what's what God said, that Moses had been brought up in the Pharaoh's household and was powerful, next slide, in speech and in action. That's what God said. Moses, God said one thing, Moses said quite the opposite thing, and when I think about that, I think, who am I going to take? Whose word am I going to take, Moses or God's? I, I'm going for God's. I'm going for God's. And I want to say, Moses, liar, liar, pants on fire. Or in the Cockney vernacular, he was talking porky, Pies. Yeah. So in Pharaoh's household, Moses was raised for a purpose. Now, this is so cool that God got to Pharaoh, to, who was one to kill him, to pay for his education, that he might become a great leader to lead the people away from the Pharaoh. And of course, at the burning bush, Moses was called for a purpose. Born for a purpose, raised for a purpose, called for a purpose. And, and that burning bush, uh, that episode, 
if you need to read it again sometime because it really is some specky encounter right there called for a purpose Moses encounter with Yahweh at the burning bush is extraordinary uh, Exodus 3 1 to 6 on your screen uh, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro Moses had left Egypt by now he'd gotten into trouble with the Egyptians and he'd gone to, gone north and he'd uh, met his bride and uh, the father, his father-in-law was the priest of Midian Jethro and he led the flock, Moses did, to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Uh, check that out when you're reading your book of Exodus. Uh, find Horeb will pop up again. Uh, and there the angel of the Lord appeared to him where? In the flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. Next verse. And so Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight. Check it out out in the desert there. You know why the bush doesn't burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him from within the bush. <laughs> Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. And God said, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Exodus 3, 13 to 15. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, what's his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And, and I, I think, you know, that's, that's kind of what parents say to their kids sometimes, you know. Tell their kids to do something, they go, why? And the answer is, because I said so. And it's, it's not really an answer, is it? That's, that's kind of taking the God position. Who shall I say, send me? Tell them, I, I am who I am sent me. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And God said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. I am who I am. Next slide. I am, by the way, those of you in the teaching industry or in the education industry know that, that, this, that I am is the verb to be. It's the verb to be. And uh, the thing about this verb to be, this particular one, uh, Yahweh is the verb to be. The name Yahweh. It is the essential I am and it is tenseless. It, it is neither past tense, present tense, nor future tense. And so it is, I am who I am, I was who I was, I will be who I will be, I am who I was, I am who I will be, and you can mix all that because the tense is not there. The name Yahweh is the essential verb to be, I am, I have always been, I am the Alpha and the Omega, I have always been, I always will be, and I am right now. And in John chapter 8, verse 58, uh, Jesus speaking, Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Hebrews 13.8 says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and, and forever. Jesus is the great I am. He always has existed. Uh, the Son of God is God the Son. He was not created. He is the Creator. No argument about that. The eternal Yahweh met Moses at the burning, burning bush and called him for a purpose, and the purpose for Moses was to lead God's people out of slavery in Egypt and to lead them into a new life in the promised land. And whichever way you slice, and, and slice it and dice it, a miracle happened right there in the wilderness at the burning bush. Moses met God. He met Yahweh. Hebrews eleven twenty six. By faith, he, that's Moses, uh, left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger, he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. <laughs> he saw a burning bush. He saw no persona in that bush. He saw him who is invisible. What happened at the burning bush? God met, uh, Moses met with the invisible, eternal God. And although at the burning bush, Moses initially told God that he would never be the public speaker because that's not who he was, who God wanted him to be. Long story short, he eventually stepped into that role. He eventually stepped into that role. And the miracles continued to flow as Moses depended on God to be the leader that God called him to be. In fact, it doesn't matter what you do for God, for life, unless you're depending upon God, you're doing it in your own strength. It's not worth anything. 
Without faith, it is impossible to please him. You need to be trusting him uh, to be pleasing God. So he stepped into that role. Uh, Acts 7, 36, he led them out of Egypt and performed wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and for 40 years in the wilderness. I just want to tell you something about wonders and signs. And if it's not on the screen, I'm hoping it might come up on the screen. Oh, it does. Wonders and signs equals miracles. He, he just did all these miracles out there. He saw them. That's, and a lot of miracles for 40 years. Lots and lots of them. And if we were going to give note to all of them tonight, you'd get home late. And I want to not get home late. And I don't want you to get home late. So I'm going to quickly give you four of them, all right? And the others may turn up somewhere as we go through this series uh, later in, in the month. Moses led those Israelites out of slavery toward the promised land. And according to the record of how many he had in the book of Numbers, by the way, Exodus, I couldn't find it, in the book of Numbers, this is what it says, and hopefully it'll be on your screen, 603,550 men aged 20 and up, that's what it says, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's right there, that's the words it says, that's verbatim, as well as women and children. Now, you can start to crunch those numbers, see how many that might be. But, you know, if like three quarters of those men were married, well, you can double that lot because they've got the wife and if there's two kids in each of the families and maybe they bred like rabbits, there might be more than that. I reckon you got up around three mil. Now, I'm thinking about that because there are some people right in this auditorium tonight that last Sunday... They went up, up, up the stadium to see a cricket match. First biggie at the, at the match. And I think at the Optus Stadium, there weren't quite that many people. There, there was 53,781. And there was a bit of a challenge for the transport industry in WA and the government to get them in and to get them out. Yeah, and they pulled it off okay, I believe. That's just 53,000, man. Moses had three mil. He had no trains, no buses. So you, you, you think about that. And, 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 and he organised this. And they left Egypt, moved north, and camped near the Red Sea. And look who's coming out after them. Because Monday morning came and the buses turned up to work and none of their staff were there. They left the country and so the Pharaoh said, you better get the staff back. I don't know what I was thinking, letting them go. And so here they are, Red Sea in front of them, Egyptian army behind them closing in pass, and the people began to weep and to wail and to began to complain and said, Moses, you should have never let us out of Egypt. We should have stayed in Egypt. We could have worked our tails off back there and been fed by them. Exodus 14 verse 10 in the Good News Bible, when the Israelites saw the king and his army marching against them, they were terrified and cried out to the Lord, for help. They're just, they're just wailing and weeping. Lord, what are we doing here? Why did we leave Egypt? You know, whose plan was that? Surely it wasn't yours. God it must have been Moses. Why have we got him as a leader? This is just not right. When things get tight in this life, and they will, whether it's in church life or wherever you work or whatever you do, uh, stop complaining. Stop staying in a non-progress mode. Expect God to bring about one of his miracles and get moving. That's the plan. Exodus 14, 15, love this, in the Living Bible. The Lord said to Moses, tell the people to quit praying and start moving. Go, Lord, I want to pray about it first. He says, no, I don't want you to. I've said you're getting out of here and you've got to get out of here. So start moving and, and, and see the miracle open up. He'll make a way where there was no way. And so the Red Sea opened up and the Israelites went through on dry land but through the other side, the Egyptians come with their chariots and God closed the water back up again. There's chariots getting bogged and there's horses going down. There's water coming and they will, they will drown. Miracle. Miracle right there. When there are three million of you on the road, that's just the first miracle you need. You see, on the road, there was no Maccas. No Hungry Jacks. No Red Rooster. No KFC. And could you believe it? Not even a dome cafe in sight. And they're on the road. You're going to need a miracle or two to feed this crowd. Three million of them. You're going to need a miracle or two to stop them complaining. 
You go, and I know, I know, I know what we're going to do. We're going to bring down manna from heaven. And manna is a, looks like it would be the most unappetizing food you could ever see. And when they were very hungry, they liked it the first day, but the second day not so much. And they said, give us meat, give us meat. And see, first of all, the Lord said, uh, next verse there, he said, I'm going to rain down manna from heaven. I will rain down bread from heaven for you. Heavenly bread, by the way. Keep that, keep that in your heads, the heavenly bread. And they go, w w we're sick of the heavenly bread. We want some meat. And actually, when you read the text, it says, God said, I'll give you meat, all right. You've asked for meat, you've grizzled about meat, you've whinged about meat, you've complained about I'm going to give you meat. I'm going to give you so much meat, it'll come out your nostrils. I don't know if you've ever been drinking a coffee or a hot chocolate and someone makes you laugh. You go, ugh, it's coming out my nostrils. Well, it could be quail. And if you want to know what quail is, they're like little chickens. That's what they are. Exodus 16, verse 13. The, that evening, quail came down and covered the camp. Little birds are just falling out of the sky and coming down, they're picking them up and they've got KFC. They've got red rooster, mini red rooster, you know. Long trip, long trip. They have, they have their bread and they have their chicken. You think, wow, miracles, miracles, miracles. But you're bound to get thirsty. On the long trip, Exodus 16, God instructed Moses with his, with his staff to strike the rock and water flowed, miracle. But just because you did it that way once, don't, don't assume and presume that's the way you're going to do it every time because the next time they needed water, God didn't say strike the rock. He said, speak to the rock. And Moses is cranky now with the people because the people got him cranky. I feel for Moses. I feel for Moses. Three million out there grumbling about this and that. Well, instead of speaking to the rock, he whacked it twice and God said, sorry, Moses, you are not entering the promised land. That's always stayed with me. So I don't want to, I don't want to erupt and I did that once. It would never worked out well. Whenever I've done that, it's not worked out well. Whenever I've reacted against people. I've seen some of you react, it's never worked out well for you either. It's never worked out well when you stick it on Facebook either. Don't do it. You've got your venting. Talk to someone trusted, vent to them and then tell them, I'm sorry I've ever vented at you and then wash your mouth out all right, and get over it because it's not going to serve you well at all. Miracle. They were fed, they were watered. Many, many more miracles, but I'm just going to give you one more this evening. This is one of my favourites right here, and you need to take this one home with you tonight. The Israelites on their journey came up against the military might of the Amalekites, Exodus 17. And Joshua and the uh, Israelite army did battle with them, while Moses actually stood on the hill with his staff raised in prayer mode. And while he's raised the staff in prayer mode, Israelites are winning and the Amalekites aren't. But after, you know, a long day with your arms like that, they get a bit tired and a bit tired and whatever, they start to get tired and come down here like so. Uh, the Amalekites would win. And so Moses' troops came up and they stuck a rock on him. He said, sit down, man, on a rock. And then they got one on each side of him to keep his arms up with a staff and they kept it up there till the sun went down. And then at that time, uh, the Israelites uh, defeated the Amalekites. And here's the, here's the lesson from this. You need to pray for your leader. And you need to keep your leader in the prayer mode. The miracle happens when we lean into God with prayer. And the sun went down, the Israelites prevailed and won the battle. Now that's a miracle, but it's attached to the leader being given the support to spend time in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the miracles. You've done it before, I believe you can do it again. Make us to be people of faith, Father. Make us to be people of prayer. Make us to be people to move forward and not use prayer as an excuse for not moving forward. Father, we believe you. We trust you. We entrust ourselves to you. And we move ahead in faith. Thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen. When you came in tonight, people, you would have... Got one of these. If you didn't get one of these and you came in tonight, just raise your hand. I'll get one to you in a moment. Yeah, this is communion. It's a two-layered thing. And I just want to think about, you know, I think that the manna when it came down probably looked like this. The description I have in my Bible, it looked like this. This is not a, a tasty steak sandwich, people. But it is bread from heaven. I believe it's a miracle in communion. 
And I believe if we miss the miracle of communion, we're just wasting our time eating some blotting paper and drinking some very ordinary grape juice. But if we see the miracle, it's bread from heaven. And in this bread from heaven, Jesus said of himself, I am the bread of life. As we read 1 Corinthians chapters 10 and 11, we understand that there's healing in the sacrifice of Jesus that is represented in this bread. I, 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 just, I just pray so much for everyone in this house to receive the healing, to receive the well-being, and to receive the abundant life that Jesus offers. Would you take the bread and eat it? It's bread from heaven. It's a miracle in Jesus' name. Receive what he has to offer, the abundant life. Would you stand with me, church? Let's go to the second layer. On the cross of Calvary, our Lord Jesus Christ shed his blood. In my Bible, I'm told that the life is in the blood. Uh, this represents the very lifeblood of Jesus. This is my blood, he said, poured out for you. It's lifeblood. I, I, I believe he wants us to live the abundant life that is found in him. The bread came down from heaven the lifeblood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's drink it tonight. Receive the miracle in Jesus' name. Our thesis and our theme for this series of messages is that God's done miracles before. He did them in Moses' day. It's just not some old-fashioned thing that's back there in an old, outmoded book. I believe he'll do them again. I believe when we, we trust him, when we look to him, we're going to see the miracles. We're going to experience the miracles. We see people around us changed because of the miracles. We've got a song to sing tonight. Let's lean into him in prayer. Let's stay in prayer mode. Let's, let's raise the staff in prayer. And when our arms get tired, let's get someone else to help us keep the arms up, raised in prayer, in Jesus' name. You ready for the song? Let's get ready to sing it. Father, we've read your word. You've spoken to us tonight about the miraculous. You've knocked down walls. You've plucked a baby out of the water. Given him an education that made him a leader. You've opened up the Red Sea, closed it again bread from heaven, meat in the desert, water in the desert, beaten off the enemy, and so much more. We're never going to forget. You've done it before and we believe you can do it again. Lord, we would like to say with confidence that we won't put up with mediocre anymore. And by the power of your spirit, we won't. Lord Jesus Christ, by you in our lives, we're going to claim the abundant life that you said you came that we might have. Thank you, Father God. We've shared in communion tonight, Lord, and not just as a ritual. We're claiming the miracle. And so, Father, take us home safely and for each person, just give us a fantastic night's sleep that tomorrow morning we'll be ready for whatever it is comes across our way, whether it's at school, in the workplace, in our travels, whatever it might be. But keep us in memory of you, Father, Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, I've got some news for you people. Steve, you're going to love this. The coffee machine's working again. Yes, it is. Yeah, 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 you can clap because I've, I tell you what, I've been hanging out for that machine to work again. And we, we, I rang the Italian man and he came on down and uh, his offside brought an Irishman with him. 
the Irishman actually fixed it, the Italian bloke did all the talking, and uh, the Irish bloke fixed it right there, and uh, yes, it's working. So get in the cafe, get yourself some raisin toast, have a coffee, a hot chocolate, whatever it is, be blessed, hang about for a bit. Don't, don't, you've got kids to get to school in the morning, you can't hang around here too long, can you? It's a full week this week, for those of you who started halfway through the week, we're back into it, praise God. Be blessed, look forward to seeing you again, and uh, prayer meeting. Wednesday night, for those of you who can make it right here, because we're going full steam ahead with Vision Sunday, 7 till 9. Yes. <laughs> 